So a view like this is actually not clear how you would take advantage of it. And Noga Alon in this paper shows you that this has many implications for solving problems in combinatorics and number theory. And the real insight is that if you look at the coefficients of the polynomial, you can tell the solution to a problem. All right, so this is actually not very surprising if you think about what Lagrange interpolation is doing. All right, so what would we like to do? What we want to do is use Nogalon's technique to solve subgraph isomorphism. So you give me two graphs, and remember, we can encode graphs using polynomials. So you give me two graphs, and you ask me, is G1, does G1 contain G2? That's the question you're asking. And I say, I want to expand some polynomial to find out whether the answer is yes. And I want to find the smallest possible polynomial to expand. You don't want a polynomial that is too large. You want the smallest possible polynomial to expand to find out the answer. So here's actually the polynomial constraints you want to solve. You want to solve for a permutation of the labels. So P is a permutation of the roots of unity. You want to solve for permutations of the roots of unity such that when you multiply B by A and subtract B, you get zero, the zero polynomial. What is really being said here is that B is a zero one matrix. The entries of B are zero one. The entries of A are zero one. If an edge is zero and it multiplies a non-zero edge of A, it's going to make that entry zero. Right? So the edges, the non-zero edge of B, are canceling out the edges of A. All right? So that only the edges of B are going to select the edges of A. So what's happening here is that it's saying B is equal to A when I cancel out the non-edges. The non-edges of B cancel the, non the edges of A. And this is a way of writing algebraically that B is inside A. All right? Now, the constraints you want is this should be true over roots of unity. So this is the Hadamard part. This should be true over roots of unity. And P must be a permutation of the roots of unity. That's the constraint. All right. We want algorithms. So how do we get our algorithms? To get our algorithms, we change this constraint. So it's inconvenient to work with a polynomial where P appears inside. Let's actually write what P is. And this is nothing other than the Lagrange interpolation formula. It just says, I want, at, I want that the root wk, when you plug in wk, it spits out, w to the power k, it spits out the rk, and rk is going to be assigned a root of unity, and all the roots of unity should be distinct. All right, so now, what we want to solve is this, we want to check that this thing is zero, modulo these constraints. And really, all we're using is Euclidean division. All right, so how do we do it? What we want to know, if indeed we expand out this polynomial and we respect these constraints, if this polynomial is equal to rk minus w sigma k, gamma k here is a permutation of the root of unity. If our polynomial is equal to this expression, this for us is a certificate of existence of solution, because if I plug in these permutation of the root of unity, this is going to be zero. So really, all I need to do is do Euclidean division by these constraints and check that indeed my polynomial can be written in this form. All right, so how do we do this? Well, to do this, we need two steps. First, we have to convince you that expanding out this polynomial can be done efficiently. Because this A is a polynomial of degree n. If I plug in another polynomial, I might need to actually expand out things and get an exponential blow up by doing this. Our, our lemma is that indeed you don't need to do it. If you raise a permutation of the roots of unity to a power, the power just applies to the roots of unity right away. So that you actually don't need to expand, you can raise the entries of your root of unity right away. So that expanding out this polynomial can be done efficiently. That's our first level. Now to actually turn the combinatorial of Salazar into a practical algorithm, 
maybe not so practical depending on the instances, the, the insight from the algorithm is the following theorem. It says the following. Let ought denote the automorphism group of our polynomial, which are the set of permutations which fix our polynomial. They don't change the polynomial. Think about these as the symmetries present in your graph. So we're saying that your polynomial admits the expansion that we seek. This expansion buys us, indeed, existence or non-existence of solution. So the polynomial admits this expansion if and only if the product over, the, over all permutations, so P sigma is a permutation matrix, the product over all permutations, if it is zero, then our polynomial admits the expansion we want. This is actually very reminiscent of the Galois resolvent and the Lagrange resolvent. You look at some expression, do the permutation of the variables, and do the product over all of them. And if indeed you get zero, there exists a solution. If you don't get zero, there exists no solution. All right? So where our set, the set on which we multiply, these are the quotients of the automorphism group. So you can partition the, the symmetric group as quotient of the automorphism group this way, so these belong to the quotient of the automorphism group, and this is the automorphism group, and therefore, by the Lagrange theorem, we know that the product of the size of t and of the automorphism of f is going to give us the symmetric group. All right. So I've learned from Nogalon that every talk should have a joke, and every talk should have a and hopefully you can distinguish the two. <laughs> okay. So I hope you got this because that was my joke. <laughs> All right? And what's going to follow now is the proof. So you can distinguish the joke from the proof. So let's go from the proof. And the proof of this is actually short. That if you can find, if this product is zero, there is an expansion of this form. So what's the proof? The first step of the proof follows from Euclidean division. If you evaluate this at the roots of unity for any permutation, if you evaluate this, this is going to be a number. I'm evaluating this thing, it's going to be a number. The reason why this number has to be positive is because the expression which we were looking at was positive for every entry. Right? So I'm saying if you plug in here the proper roots of unity, this thing would cancel, and you're left with a number. And this is true for every permutation. All right? So now, let's apply a permutation to this guy. If you apply a permutation to this guy, it's actually going to align this RK and the sigma. Right? This is going to become sigma inverse K. So it aligns these guys. And the beauty of being aligned is that now if I plug in just the roots of unity without any permutation, I would get zero. Right? So if I plug in here now roots of unity without any permutation, in this expression I get zero. This W1 is the second column of the discrete Fourier matrix. So these are the roots of unity without any permutation. All right? So now the argument is the following. Well, if this statement is true for any permutation, clearly if I do the product over all permutation, this statement is still going to be true. It's the product over all these constants. Well, now I can plug in this guy in this expression here. It's going to give me the product of these constants. So when can this be 0? Well, this is going to be 0 if for one permutation it was 0. So this is our trick. So the argument here is, notice that if none of these guys were 0, then this product would never be 0. That's one. And second, this polynomial is symmetric. It's a symmetric polynomial. So it sort of describes the behavior of your original polynomial after you symmetrize it. That's why we called it the resolvent. All right, so we'll think about this expression here as the combinatorial resolvent. And maybe this polynomial is too large. There's a smaller subset we can multiply. Well, the smaller subset you multiply is the quotient. You do the product over the quotient of the automorphism group. Because if you do the product over all polynomials, the automorphism is repeating that many times. I mean, this term repeats that many times for every element of the quotient. So it's sufficient to do the product over these guys. 
Is it clear? All right. So, and this completes our proof. What we wanted to show is that this thing is zero if and only if there exists a permutation such that the corresponding constant was zero. So what this actually says is the following. It says, if you want to know whether a polynomial is, admits the expansion we want, all you need to do is permute the variables, multiply it, permute the variables, multiply it, and if you do the permutation over all permutations, you're going to get a symmetric polynomial, and if it evaluates to zero, you're good. If it doesn't, uh, then that is a certificate of non-existence of solution. Now, the issue with this is that the polynomial is too large. So let's think about a randomized, a randomized approach for decreasing the hardness of your problem. So now we want to use our observation to create a hardness attenuation framework. And the way you should think about it is a bit like using Google. So nobody on his own computer searches the whole web to create his own ranking table. You let Google do that work, and then you interact with Google. So what we want is the following. I have a, a graph. I want to prove that it exists, a solution exists to my subgraph isomorphism instance. I let somebody else compute the product. He's not going to compute the product over all permutations. He's going to compute the product over a subset of the permutation. But by him doing that, he increases my probability of determining that the graph is isomorphic. Right? So now I want to say, how should that framework work? So let's think about the initial setup. We said we want to determine, determine whether this polynomial admits zero for some permutation. Our probability of success is very small. As a matter of fact, here is the probability of us succeeding. If the graph were isomorphic, right? so this is the probability of this being different from zero, given that our graph were isomorphic. If our graph was isomorphic, and I've done no symmetrization, then the size of the automorphism group is a good candidate. Everything else is a bad candidate. So what is the size of the bad candidate? The size of the bad candidate is n factorial minus the size of the automorphism group. All right, so this is before I talk to Google. The web seems unpenetrable. Now Google does some work. I do some work, all right? I say I'm going to symmetrize, but I'm not going to use the whole quotient of the automorphism group. I'm going to use a subset of the quotient of the automorphism. All right. By him doing this, my probability now of failure decreases. Right? This is probability of me concluding that the graphs are not isomorphic while they were isomorphic. By him doing this work, computing this expansion, he, increase, he increases my probability of success. Or another way of saying it, decreases my probability of success. And this is sort of the factor. Also, what are we saying? We're saying that if he does all the work, then I know with probability zero, I'm going to fail. If he does partial amount of work, this is my probability of failure. So I can deduce from this uh, the probability of success. So in the hardness attenuation framework, we say our oracle does work. He does, he does a partial product. And we know that for every element of the coset that he adjoins into this product, he decreases my probability of failure by exactly this factor. So every time he adjoins, he's going to subtract to the probability of failure this amount. <coughs> so now we can ask, how big should the product be in order for the probability of success to be 1 minus p? So if you want the probability of success to be 1 minus p, then you have to pick a set and any subset of the coset group will do of this size. Now, what is it bias? What do we pay? Well, unfortunately, Google has to do some work. He has to start, at some point in the procedure, a polynomial of this size. This is the number of terms in the original polynomial you started out with. So he has to start a polynomial of this size to the power of the subtraction of these two sets. So there's no free lunch. He's not buying you a certificate of existence, or he's not increasing your probability of success for free. What you're paying is the size of this set, and you can see it's exponential in, the, in this difference. So that really says that if you started out with a problem where there are many symmetries, if your graph was almost symmetrical, 
then indeed, it would be easy for the oracle to give you a polynomial that increases your probability of success. However, if, there were main, if your graph was very far from being symmetrical, that is, the automorphism group is very small, then the polynomial that he will have to store from which you're going to deduce the existence of solution is going to be very large. Right. And this, this is how we turn in, we're arguing that the algorithm suggested by the combinatorial of Salinton, we want to expand out the polynomial and look from the coefficients, read out whether a solution exists or not, is essentially going to be brought to us by this expanding out this polynomial. So let me recap. Where we've been so far. Yes. So the, the formation you store depends only on A but not on B, right? Which one? On the, the graphs? Yeah. It, 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 it depends on both. So here's why. So this huge information, sort of the Google creates, it depends on both graphs. Yes, it depends on both graphs, and here's why. So remember, we said what we want to check is that if B selects the edge, the corresponding edge of the relabeled graph, it has to be equal to P. Then now, if you look at this polynomial before the sum, it depends both on x0, x1, and the entries of R. So now we say, well, if we square the entries of this polynomial, if we square, we square this polynomial, all, for all values of x0 and x1, is going to be positive. If I square the entries of the polynomial, this one, before the sum, if I square the entries, it's always going to be positive. Now, what's nice about 0, 1 graph is that if you square the entries, you get exactly the same thing. This thing here is a 0, 1 matrix. This thing here is a 0, 1 matrix. So squaring it gives you the same thing. Now, I'm summing over all the entries now, all the roots of unity. So the dependence on x0 and x1 disappears. By the time the x0, the dependence of x0 and x1 disappears, I've essentially tied the two graphs. And now I'm looking at, I'm searching for permutations of R. So the argument now is that the the polynomial I've created, for which I want to know whether a permutation exists, which is going to make this zero, essentially is tying the graph A and B. It's not just taking A. It has to take A and it has to take B. Yeah. So what is the setting in which, it's, in which this is useful? So, so um, because I, I could imagine a setting where there, there is this huge graph Yes. And then like I am coming with my like smaller graph yes. as sort of an input. Yes. And there is this huge database and then I'm trying to sort of match it and there is this information which helps. Me. But it seems that like Google knows everything. So well so what is so so, so then why does not it just solve all the way the whole problem? rather so, than like leaving some part of the computation. Exactly. So yes. So Google knows, but what you give to Google is the information for both graphs. Now Google says, I'm going to be doing, uh, I'll do all the work if you're willing to pay me $1,000 because this is how much time it's going to take me to expand out the whole polynomial up to the end. Person says, well, I'm not interested in paying $1,000. Just increase my probability by a factor of two. So it says, OK. If that's, you just want a factor of two, then I'm going to check. I know what the automorphism group is. I'm going to check, and I'm going to give you half of the quotient of the automorphism group. And then you, you, this provably increases your probability by a factor of two, and you deal with that. So he gives me a, a polynomial which is not expanded. I still have to expand this. So I either have to go to him and say, well, you know, I'm willing to pay more, expand more. And he explains more of the polynomial, so I can read off my answers. So I argue that it's not that Google preprocesses for all possible inputs. Google can solve the automorphism problem, presumably. So Oracle can solve the automorphism problem, which is solving the isomorphism problem. The sub-isomorphism uses that Oracle to decide how much work he's going to do in preprocessing for me. So we should think about this as an improvement on grognard basis algorithm which says, give me a system of algebraic equation, I do a lot of work, and you don't get to see what's happening in between, because what's happening in between is not really informative. It's only in the end. If I produce one, that's a certificate that there was no solution to the problem you're solving. And if I give you a Grobner basis, that's a certificate that, indeed, there is a solution to your system of control. 
So what we want is something that actually allows us to peek in between these steps and for which we can completely compute the running time. So, so that's the idea. Have I answered the question? So it's sort of a certificate that you can actually check that it's correct. Yes. Right? So yes. Yes. So yes, yeah, definitely it does make sense. Yeah. So um, that it's sort of a trade-off between the size of the certificate right. and the size and the checking time. Or yes. Something like that. Yes. 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 So what what we have here is sort of an upper bound. So the result here, here is saying this is the upper bound of the threshold we're doing. Now, you know, there's room for improvement because it's known that this measure just counts the set of monomials. If you had some better circuit implementation of this polynomial, maybe you can come up with a much better measure. And then, you know, you could use circuit lower bound to, to improve this threshold. Say, you know, there's these very convenient circuits which actually implement this polynomial. And therefore, you can use them to actually improve the threshold of the amount you have to start versus the amount of work that has to be done. Right. So there's definitely room for improvement here. Right. Okay, so let me summarize where we've been so far. We started with the points we wanted to know if these two series were the same. We had this inflation scheme. Inflation scheme is nice. It took a, a long time to actually find a constructive way of describing these things. But in the end, the frustration is, in both cases, we end up with polynomial constraints to solve. So when we rewind that the clock, we said, let's go back to the combinatorial constraints and see how we would actually solve them. Now, we were very lucky. People like Noga Alonz and others had already worked out the, the field for us. They said they had if you looked at these polynomials, looking at the coefficients of the extended form, you can know whether a solution exists or not. He asked whether we can actually turn this into an algorithm. We say yes, actually, you can turn it into an algorithm. In some cases, you can turn it into an oracle checking. But the price you pay is that the expressions you want are very large, depending on how, how big the certificates are. And they depend on the symmetries. So the more symmetries, the better. So um, this is where I think it's reasonable to conclude the talk. Uh, and I wish to express thanks to the members of the committee and the professors here, and acknowledge support from NSF uh, for funding me during this uh, research investigation. Thank you. Right, so I, I said 12.30 is 25, so we have time for question. Uh, any question is welcome. Yes. So you said that Noga's um, theorem has a new um, generalization. Yes. Um, this year. So that's the generalization. So what is the generalization, and is it possible that it's going to buy you something? Something. The answer to that is no. So the generalization does not buy me something. What is the generalization, actually? It's not much of the generalization. The generalization, the Nogalan original statement, crucially requires that the monomial you look at is the one with the special structure of the degrees. So the generalization proposed by Mikhail Lasson says we can relax the constraint on the degrees. However, he needs assumption on the support of the degrees. So this just says Logalon is working on a polynomial using the lexicographical order on the monomials. He's using different orders on the monomial and makes also arguments about the sets, the size, the largest size of sets, which are zero free. Okay, so if you need order on monomials, then you are in somehow doing elimination, Gaussian elimination on the monomials. So it's not going to buy us anything for our argument. Our argument is trying to reason about this without talking in removing the ordering on the monomials and the variables. Doing that only in the end. We want to separate these two things. Uh, so that's where the algorithm is coming from. Uh, but the way, maybe, you know, if you treat, you know, this, uh, 
here is that this is taking some ordering. We should actually look at the Newton polytope over all monomials, and then we can actually improve and express a more general version of this theorem. So this actually says something about the support of these mon monomials. But this is just one special basis. You can look at the polytope of all possible bases, and then express a criteria for picking one of them. So it's, it's not going to change this factor, right? So this is a size the largest size of zero free is ai must be greater or equal to alpha i. So alpha i is the smallest, is the largest size you, that could be zero free. And this actually does not change in both versions of the theorem. It's only the assumptions of the monomials that change. And here, he's, making a, he's using a different ordering on the variables. So if we look at the polytope of all possible ordering, maybe we can actually exp express a more general version of this theorem. Um, but I don't think it's going to buy us anything in terms of our algorithm, because our algorithm is actually this part, which really comes down to a polynomial of degree n cannot have n plus 1 roots without being 0 everywhere. Right. So that's essentially what we're using. And we are modifying Grobner basis in such a way that we are separating the monomial ordering from the actual work of expanding our polynomials. That's essentially the take-home message. We use an extension of the ternary operation yes. to did anybody investigate it? So that's a wonderful question. So Del Messner and Pravia Bhattacharya, in their paper, uh, they focus only on on the ternary operation. And, and they say they say in their paper, our definition trivially holds for higher definitions. So in the paper that we published in 2011, we actually expressed the spectral theorem for order order n. But there, it's actually clear that if you're looking at a tensor of order n, the curse of dimensionality hits you really fast. Because a tensor of order n in spectral decomposition are tensor of order n minus 1. So you have to take each one of them and do again the tensor decomposition. So by the time you reach 2, you have exponentially many objects you're looking at. And that's what the eigenvalues are actually described. So the reason why you have exponentially many eigenvalues is because there's a hierarchy of nested tensors of different orders. And if you just want some spectral decomposition, you can just cancel one dimension. That's one order. That's essentially what we're doing. So that's why from matrices you go to vectors. If you start with tensor of order 3, you go to matrices. And then you can do something on them to go to vectors. And there, because we're starting with order 3, you know, we expect uh, the blow up is not going to be too high. But we haven't investigated for our higher order tensors. I have a more general question. So, sure. your probability yes. uh, guarantee grows linearly with the amount of work that you do, right? Yeah, so we are growing linearly with the size of the automorphism. So, let me pull up the slide. So, every time you adjoin a coset, every time you adjoin a coset, you, this is the amount you increase to your probability of success. Exactly this. Well, my question is, is there any quick heuristic way you can sort of estimate the constant? Oh, oh, that's a very good question. I don't know of a quick heuristic way of estimating the constant. And the, the issue really is that this oracle actually has to be very powerful. There is a specific, per this is specific family of permutation you have to adjoin. And if you adjoin any random other permutation, it's actually not clear. You might be messing up the polynomial. That's not clear. So I haven't really done experiments to estimate really, um, you know. It would be interesting to see if the eigenvalues or something. Oh, how it would depend on the eigenvalues? That's right. I think there would be very li little dependence with the eigenvalues. Because really what's happening here is asking, if I relabel, you take a matrix, take a matrix, the adjacency matrix, apply a permutation on the row apply the same permutation on the column. 
Are you getting the same matrix? Did your matrix change? If your matrix, if the answer is yes, it changed.